pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. David Bansker, uh, who, as many of you know, I, I see that you have lots of good friends here, um, is the founding dean of the, of the school of Hanf, uh, which is UTSU. That's why he has two pins in his record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, David is, uh, as many of you know, um, is um, is came through came to uh, came back to, to Portland to lead the, the new school um, uh, from Harvard, where he was professor in the, in the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health and director of the Global Health as the Mass General Hospital. Um, and he he trained in um, in, um, in in medical school of John, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, did a PhD um, an MPH at uh, UC Berkeley. Worked in, uh, in this his medical residency in, in North North Harlem, where he started working on on um, health disparities in urban, particularly urban poverty, homelessness, uh, violence, HIV, etc., etc. That I think inspired the rest of his career in, in this type of work. Led him to international work in uh, in many places, uh, uh, Uganda, India, etc., etc. He has visited. Uh, professor appointments in the in, in Barara University in um, in, uh, in Uganda in the Velour Institute of Technology in India, etc. He has an uh, incredibly long uh, record of accomplishments that it would take too much time to to recite. Um, I will I will I don't want to to see his uh, bio in uh, in the announcement. So I just uh, wanted to thank him for taking mm -hmm. the time to come and visit. I, I hope this is one of the many opportunities to interact with him um, and to collaborate with, uh, with, with this school. Um, I think we have very complementary strengths in the two colleges, and, and I think um, David understands that and agrees with that. He'll be back here in Corvallis on Monday for the, uh, for the OPHA, OPHA. Okay. so there will be other opportunities to interact with him. He, I know he's going to have a, um, a, a um, session with, uh, with some researchers and some faculty right after this talk. Uh, please feel free to stay if you can. Uh, so please uh, join me in, in welcoming David uh, to our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. It's great to be back uh, in Corvallis. Just had a very civilized lunch with music. Uh, yeah, the classical piano music this is a lot more civilized than my usual lunch, which is on a TriMet bus between the PSU campus and the OHSU campus. Uh, it's also a real pleasure to be asked to talk about my research. I rarely get asked to talk about my research. Usually I'm asked for my face. <laughs> I don't know if you have that experience. <laughs> it reminds me of a college a family that dropped their child off at college. and. Didn't have the right housing, the course schedule was all messed up. The father was really upset and approached somebody, not knowing it was the dean of the school, and said, I am so mad. This school can't get anything together. I refuse to talk to anybody lower than the dean. He said, Sir? There is no one lower than, than the dean. <laughs> I'll talk. <laughs> oh, yeah. I use it. Yeah, <laughs> feel free to use it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about HIV, uh, adherence to HIV treatment and prevention. And tell this through the lens of poverty and health disparities. And the message I'd like to communicate is we, as public health leaders, often have strong views as to what will or won't happen, which shapes policy. And sometimes our views and expectations are simply wrong, and that can get in the way of doing very important good. Now, I'll talk about four things. First, adherence to HIV antiretroviral treatment. Lost of follow-up, which is a form of adherence to care, adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis where you're giving someone who's HIV negative daily antiretrovirals to prevent them from becoming infected by a positive person. Finally, we'll talk about patterns of adherence and how that shapes outcomes. I'd like to start this story in 1997, a year after the development of effective antiretroviral therapy 
when we turned HIV from a terminal disease to a manageable chronic disease. As these miracle drugs were put into practice, many were concerned that if we give medications to the homeless, the mentally ill, to drug users, that they would miss their doses. The virus would replicate, become resistant to these medications, and that such marginalized populations could then transmit this resistant virus to a broader population. And some public health leaders thought that there was a public health rationale to withhold treatment from such at-risk populations. And as this New York Times says, doctors withhold HIV pill regimen from some, their failure to follow a rigid schedule could hurt others they fear. To support this, these drugs were just put on the, uh, were just available. Long story short, after about a decade of research, we found that the homeless and mentally ill drug users have pretty much the same adherence, at least there's a lot of overlap with it, with everyone else. And the differences are very small. And that ironically, with the first drugs that were available, the drugs weren't very good. And the people who developed drug-resistant virus were the ones who took most and sometimes all of their medications. Because the drugs just simply weren't potent enough to suppress the virus, even people with near-perfect levels of adherence. So we delayed antiretroviral treatment to marginalized populations for the fear of resistance. But what we forgot is the reason we provide treatment is not to prevent drug resistance, but prevent the progression and death, progression to AIDS and death by AIDS. This same concern played out in the early 2000s when we as a field were slow to recognize that 90% of the HIV epidemic lived in sub-Saharan Africa. And the thought was, will the poor, the least educated in the world, be able to adhere to these medications? Will they develop drug resistance and spread drug resistance to a larger population? Here's a quote by Warren Stevens that said, in sub-Saharan Africa, the potential short-term gains from reducing individual morbidity and mortality may be far outweighed by the potential for the long-term spread of drug resistance. In Africa, higher proportions of patients are likely to fall into the category of poor adherers unless resource-intensive programs are available. And some thought that the only way we would ever be able to give antiretroviral therapy to Africa is with directly observed therapy where we make sure that every patient takes every dose. We started following the first few people on HIV treatment in the early 2000s in a town called Embarara, Uganda, associated with Embarara University. And we first followed 50, eventually we followed thousands, but I found that people did really well. And I got a call on November or September 3rd, um, 2003 by Donald McNeil from the New York Times and said, hey, I looked at your paper. Do you really believe it's true? I said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Explain why. And next day on Labor Day, New York Times comes out on my doorstep, both home and there it is, left-hand side, below the fold, Africans outdo U.S. therapy. Africans outdo U.S. and following AIDS therapy. Since then, we, it's not the Africans are necessarily doing that much better because regimens have simplified and most everyone is doing really well to suppress virus. But there are, they did great. And that is an important story, but I think the story gets more interesting when you understand what people had to do to overcome the barriers to treatment in order to do so well. Let me go to the work of Norma Ware, who studied just over 200 people in in-depth qualitative interviews in Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. These are people on antiretroviral therapy. And she said, tell me about taking your treatment. Why do you take your treatment? And the first thing she found when she takes these narratives together and comes up with themes is that people take their, took their therapy for the same reason everyone does, and that's to improve their health. But the story becomes more interesting when you understand the severity of the resource scarcity that people 
are taking their therapy under. Now, many people would describe stories of living 20, 30 kilometers away from clinic, having to spend half a month's wage simply to get the clinic to pick up the medications. And then a whole day of being in the field or in the market, earning income or generating food to, to have the medications simply to take. Imagine spending half of your income just to make it to Walgreens to pick up your hypertensive medications. How did people overcome these economic challenges? Well, they, they relied on their relationships with their family and their friends to overcome their economic barriers. The family would see the person get ill from AIDS, would often be bedbound. This is someone who was productive in the family, now bedbound. People are worried about their health, their well being, but also it's not only taking one person away from economic activity for the family, producing food for the family, but also someone else to care for them. They see them get on treatment, get healthy after a matter of just a couple months and go back into the field to work. So, wow, these are miracle drugs. I'm going to make sure, do everything I can to help this person get the clinic to stay on these drugs. I'll give whatever money I have. I'll mine the, I'll mine the market. I'll work in the field so this person can get the clinic to get those drugs. And with the family member, they keep making that kind of sacrifice. The person who's positive values and honors that sacrifice by taking their medications. My brother, my sister, my mother, my father sacrifice. So I'm going to repay that sacrifice by making sure I take every dose on time so I can stay healthy and strong and give back to the family. And then by giving back to the family, that re builds that relationship such that the family or their friend is more likely to support them next time. And this is positive feedback loop. And the economic value of this can be described as social capital. So here's how we put it together from a behavioral science perspective. We have these structural and economic barriers to care. This is the cost of transportation to make it to clinic, being away from income and food production. That's what we believe is the major determinant of treatment adherence in a resource poor setting. There's also these routine, routine barriers that are present in every place. Medication side effects, depression, substance use, which we see in the north, the rich and poor settings. But people leverage their social capital to overcome, to mitigate, as an effect modifier of these structural economic barriers. So if you have a barrier here, that social capital lessens the impact of these structural and economic barriers. This framework helped me understand stigma in an entirely new way. I used to see stigma as this cognitive, emotional domain, depressing, isolating, which is true. But also, when you view adherence through the lens of economic and structural barriers and mitigated by social capital, stigma has a whole nother effect. If you can't tell someone you're HIV positive, you can't ask them for help. And so you neutralize the major resource that people have to overcome economic barriers, which explains why stigma is probably is one of the most powerful predictors of poor outcomes, and poor adherence and outcomes to HIV treatment. Let me turn to loss to follow-up. A number of studies have shown that loss to follow-up or retention to care, especially in poor settings, is a major barrier to long-term treatment success. And up to 40% of people over two years can be lost. I'm going to turn to the work of Norma Ware to try to understand this phenomenon, where she looked at 91 people in Nigeria, Uganda, and Tanzania who had been lost to care for more than six months. We go out and we find them. It's one of the things we're good at is finding people in rural, uh, poor settings. We find them or find a family member um, and ask them what happened. And we find that these structural and economic barriers are a major reason why people are lost to care. So one person said, what caused me to not come to clinic was that I lost my father. He died, went to the town for the burial, and the money that I had 
for the burial ran out. Also, I, I had to first stay there to make some, make some more to facilitate my return. When I was able to return to my home, I failed to get the money for transport to the hospital, and so I started working to be able to earn the amount to facilitate my transport to care. Family member dies. Costs money to bury the family member. Doesn't have enough money to get back home. And then once he gets home, needs to make more money to go to clinic. But when that person does get enough resources to go to clinic, they go to clinic and they see a nurse or a doctor or a treatment counselor. And that treatment counselor, nurse or doctor understands they missed the visit. And they understand the important of, importance of treatment adherence. And they often scold the patient. And here's a quote from one of the patients who came back. They told me, you are late. Now there are problems that people face. I don't know how they perceive it, but for me, this is very difficult. Attending clinic every month is difficult because you have to leave your work, sometimes report late, reasons like these. Everyone has problems. They're supposed to solve these problems with love, not harshly like they do. And so people are afraid of their words, abusive words. They behave as if we are there to beg for meds. So someone misses an appointment because of an unexpected cost, a death of a loved one. They go back, they're punished, and then they give up. And what Norma describes this as terminal disengagement. I was scared of coming back and then telling me that they will not accept me because I did not come back when they told me to. I was wondering whether they would accept me or not and whether they would scold me. The person gives up, stops therapy. So the way we look at this is that a structural and economic barrier that makes it difficult to go to clinic leads to that first missed or late visit. The patient overcomes that barrier, goes back to clinic. The clinicians have said adherence is the most important thing. You were late. But that's just perceived as a punitive message, which demotivates the person to come back again. And you have terminal disengagement. Next, I'd like to turn to adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. Again, this is where an HIV negative person is taking one pill once a day of tenofovir FTC in order to prevent from becoming infected by a positive person. There were a number of studies that rolled out. The first three studies showed that there was no effect. And then some studies started to roll out which showed, well, actually, it does work. And and some others say it works really well. And some studies have shown that it works almost perfectly. A lot of heterogeneity. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent with these studies that show wide range of heterogeneity. What does it do to? Well, here's, here's a list of a number of these studies. Adherence or percent reduction in HIV incidence is on the Y axis. You see several studies done, mostly in South Africa, of 0% efficacy as the best estimate. And then uh, several studies up to 90% efficacy. If you take the participants' blood and you ask how many, what proportion of blood samples have drug detectable in them, you see this near linear relationship between levels of adherence in the study and the degree of efficacy. And we believe in looking at patients with continuously positive drug in blood, no one's been infected. So these drugs are entirely effective when people take them. The question is, what explains the heterogeneity with respect to this adherence behavior? And we went back and asked people who were taking pre-exposure prophylaxis, and we ask people in a study in Uganda, which are s stable partnerships of known di in known discordant relationships. So these are heterosexual partnerships. One person's positive, one person's negative. They've been together for at least six months. And we ask them, so t both partners, tell me about taking PrEP. Well, the first thing these partners say is they describe what's called a discordance dilemma. I'm positive. She's negative. This makes us both anxious. I'm 
anxious about giving her my HIV. She's anxious about being, becoming infected. This anxiety causes stress in our relationship. It pulls us apart. But the opportunity to have something to prevent infection prep, creates an opportunity for us to worry less about this discord's dilemma, mitigates this discord's dilemma. So when I have prep, and if this prep is working, it makes me feel closer to my partner. I am want to go to clinic to help her get the medications. Go maybe pick them up myself. I will mind the shop. I will work her on prep because this brings us closer together. And actually the couples describe the impact of prep as increasing the love in the relationship. This paper published in Jage is entitled, What Does Love Have to Do With It? <laughs> that was my, my most important contribution to the paper. <laughs> it's also, which explains why PrEP works in the studies that worked well. Those are stable discordant partnerships for the most part. And the studies that didn't work well were often in South Africa where the woman is recruited without the partner, often in a relationship where the woman is much younger than the man. There's a power dynamic that woman, the woman feels uncomfortable disclosing that she's taking PrEP because it may give the sign that she's HIV positive, that she's taking HIV medication. She's relying on this relationship economically, so hides that information. So she can't engage the partner in helping, reminding her and helping her take PrEP. But this can go the other way. That in... The, when the relationship is threatened, the prep, the pill, can remind the partnership that they're discordant. That's why they're taking the medication. And if the negative partner or the positive partner has a relationship with someone else, the person, the negative person, says, why am I taking this medication? I don't trust him. And that when people stop taking PrEP, it's usually due to discord in the relationship. The pill can remind, can be a reminder of problems in the relationship. And when the relationship becomes problematic, the negative person stops PrEP. Here's a good example of that. This is a MEMS cap, which records when this pill bottle is open and closed. This is the um, Tenofovir FCC PrEP. And this was a participant in Kenya, a uh, photo and story courtesy of Fran Pretty, uh, a woman in Kenya who's HIV negative with a positive partner. And she learned that her partner was having sex with someone else. She got mad. She took her bottle of medications and threw it at him so hard that it broke not only the MEMS cap, but fractured the pills. When I was in Boston, we would say we were going to recruit her for the Red Sox. <laughs> but this story shows that the relationship between the positive and negative person is powerful in determining and influencing PrEP adherence. Next, I'd like to turn to patterns of adherence. When we first started looking at adherence to HIV therapy as a field, we had a fairly simple approach, like what are the proportion of pills taken? Got to take most all. You got to want 100% is your goal, and if you're close to 100%, that's good. But we find out there's adherence, the relationship between adherence and how adherence impacts the virus is very dynamic over time. And it's not only how many pills you miss, it's the patterns and how you, whether you miss pills consecutively or miss pills occasionally. So this is a study by Vivian Lima. Uh, UBC, who looked at patients with pharmacy, looked at pharmacy refill adherence of patients who were suppressed and asked, what is the risk of virologic rebound over the time that someone's on antiretroviral therapy? 
and stratified these participants in four levels of adherence. So in each strata, everyone has roughly the same adherence. So adher adherence is controlled for. And what she found is that the risk of virologic failure goes down the longer you're on therapy. So when you first, especially at lower levels of adherence, or at moderate levels of adherence, even the high levels of adherence, your risk of virologic rebound uh, is moderately high. But as you get to 12 months of therapy, at any level of adherence, the risk of rebound decreases. What we think this is, is as you're on treatment, you have the circulating virus and you have your latent virus. First, you suppress your circulating virus. And then over time, you have this latent virus in your um, monocytes. And those start to decay over time. So as you're on treatment for months and especially years, your total viral burden decreases, which gives you more of an adherence cushion. So you could miss a few more doses a year into therapy than when you first start therapy and still remain suppressed. And then it's not just, that's pharmacy refill data, which gives you an average estimate over between uh, each month. But it's not just average adherence is important. We find that interruptions of treatment, where you're interrupting medications for several days at a time, is even more important. And these are not uncommon. This is a study we did in rural Uganda. And we are following patients on these electronic pill caps. And we ask, how often do they interrupt therapy? Follow these patients for six months. And how asked how often someone would interrupt for at least 48 hours. Well, they interrupt two times on average every six months. And these interruptions are about 11 days. These interruptions accounted for 90% of all missed doses. So this was the most common pattern of adherence. And the reason people interrupted is they didn't have the money to go to clinic to pick up their medications. Or, or also very early in the epidemic, sometimes they would make it to clinic and the clinic would run out of medications and have no medications to give them. So they lead to a 11-day you know, 10 to 14 day interruption. This is not forgetting to take your pills. This is just not having pills to take. And then we found taking these two concepts together of how the adherence spiral suppression relationship changes over time and also the value of interruption. We said, how do these, how do these come together? And this is work by Mark Seidner and Nicholas Muzanguzi. Where we asked, we follow patients over time. We measured their adherence. And we ask, what is the probability of virologic failure at every level of adherence versus interruptions, and how does that change over time? And we replicated, in terms of probability of viremia by average level of adherence, it goes down over time. This is less than 12 months. This is greater than 12 months. If you're on therapy for more than 12 months, at each level of adherence, your risk of virologic failure is less. However, if you interrupt, and you're interrupting by at least 72 hours, your risk of virologic failure for an interruption, one or more interruptions, is the same for, at, for more than 12 months of therapy as less than 12 months of therapy. So you can miss a few doses a year into therapy, as long as those doses aren't together. And once you miss 72 hours, no matter how long you've been on therapy, your risk of rebound is just like when you started. So these interruptions are key. How do we figure out when people are interrupting? Well, one of the important factors is to say, well, what is the time course of interruption? How long of an interruption becomes dangerous? A study I did was Jean-Jacques Parenti, where we looked at people on MEMS caps, and they did spontaneous interruptions. And we asked, how long can someone interrupt before they lose control of their virus? So on the y-axis, you have the probability of people with virologic control. And on the x-axis, you have the duration of interruptions in days. So you can see someone can interrupt their therapy for three, four days, and their probability of virologic expression stays quite high. Three, four days, you're probably OK. Then after three or four days, the probability of suppression starts to go down. And the risk of virologic failure at 14 days is 50%. So you have a three to four day window. If you can find out when someone's interrupting, you can get them back on treatment and prevent them from rebounding and potentially becoming drug resistant. 
Well, with work led by Jessica Haber, we started looking at electronic monitoring in real time. This is called the Wise Pill device, where it holds about a month of medications in this container. And every time the container is opened, it sends out an SMS signal to a server that records that that pill bottle has been opened in real time. And then that goes through to a server. You can then hook that up to communicating with a patient via cell phone through a SMS text to let them know you interrupted. You know, are you okay? Um, you, should, you should get back on treatment. And then if that interruption is lasting long enough, then you can engage not only an SMS text, you can call that person up using a live person, or if that person's interrupting for three days, four days, you can send someone out on a motorcycle to actually get them back on treatment. So the first one day interruption could be a text. The second day could be a phone call. The third day could be a visitor. So we started, we looked at this. Here's a patient in rural Uganda who said it's fine, for, it's okay for us to share her picture and her story. And here is her electronic adherence record. She's on once daily therapy. You see she's taking her medications uh, between uh, 9 and 10 at night on a daily basis. Looks good. This is, she probably opened this pill bottle up to refill her pill bottle. And as you see, this is the 5th of October, 2017. This is today. So we can know in real time whether she's going to miss and could interact with her even by telephone from here. We looked at the impact of a system where we compare passive electronic monitoring with MEMSCAPS with this more active monitoring. And an active monitoring which had uh, provided a cell phone text. Someone missed. And then someone missed long enough, we would go out and check on them and actually draw their blood um, to figure out whether the, what the risk of rebound was. So we switched people from this passive electronic monitoring to this active electronic monitoring. And we found that first adherence is pretty good with the passive monitoring. It goes about 85%. And as soon as we switch, it goes up about 10% to 95%. So that just having the system with relatively little intervention improved adherence by 10%. How does the system work? What do patients think about the system? First, we were we were worried. We we're very worried that people, patients, would think, okay, we are the antiretroviral police. We're monitoring them, and they would be suspicious. And so we followed them fairly carefully and asked them, so tell us what this experience is like. We we're very pleasantly surprised that patients described this effect. That. First, we had the SMS reminders when people missed doses, and we had the real-time monitoring itself, and we asked them about each of these. And there was three domains that emerged. First, it was just the presence of the device in the system reminded them about adherence and the importance of adherence and helped establish a ha what people, patients described as a habit of adherence. They also, many of these patients live in a very rural setting. Making a clinic can take half a day. And they felt connected to the clinic by this electronic connection. And the fact that the clinic wanted to stay in touch with them in real time made them describe feeling cared for or cared for by the clinic. My doctor, my nurse, my adherence counselor cares enough to watch me every day. And finally, knowing that that information is going to the clinic, that someone that I'm first I'm being reminded that this adherence is important, that my clinic cares for me enough to watch me, makes me feel positive and better, uh, feel positive about my clinic. The way I can honor my cl clinicians, my doctor, my nurse, my adherence counselor, is by taking my medication, just like that relationship. I can honor that relationship by taking my medication. And the combination of these things by themselves, we think, are, lead to this 10% improvement in adherence. So I'd like to uh, finish up with a quote. A quote by Andrew Natsios, a former USAID administrator, who said, Africans don't know what you're talking about, or don't know what Western time is, and don't know what you're talking about when asked to take drugs at specific times. This is early 2000. As we're debating, discussing whether we should 
roll out antiretroviral therapy to Sub-Saharan Africa. Have a had a medical student at UCSF working in Uganda, and she did a home visit for a patient named John. And uh, medical student is Marissa Mayer. She's now uh, an infectious disease attending at OHSU. But Marissa came, we we're in Uganda. She said, I met this most amazing patient. His name is John. He's never been educated a day in his life. He works as a farmer and lives with his extended family in a three room mud walled house. If you inventory everything that this family owns, they have a lantern, a bed, a sofa, a bike, a radio, but no watch. Ergo, the nacho, quote, how is he going to take his medication without a watch, without any education? He started his antiviral therapy for fairly advanced disease. We followed his adherence cap here, and Here's his adherence record over the first 90 days. He's on twice daily therapy. These openings are about 7.20 a.m. These openings are about 7.20 p.m. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? So if you sum up his adherence, he's taking 90% of his doses within 10 minutes of 7.20 a.m. And the evening, he's a little bit looser. It takes him a total of 17 minutes to get 90% of his doses in. His old is 98.9%, the 1.1% was a MEMS cap failure. This isn't just good adherence. This is pretty much perfect adherence. This is not minute by minute adherence. This is second by second adherence. He has no watch. How's he doing this? Well, he's on the equator. That's half the answer. <laughs> Very good. He's. He's on the equator. The sun rises at 7.03 a.m. and 7.03, it sets at 7.03 p.m. The variation over the course of the year is about three to four minutes. And I've watched, I like watching the sunrise and sunset. It's beautiful, but does that give you like, can you time it to the second? And then it's rising and setting at 7.03, but he's taking his medication at 7.20. There's a second half of the story. How does he get it second by second? Hmm? Oh, yeah, what? Fully up, fully down. Fully up, fully down. That's good. I know it's every home with that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's not the it's a limbus. Maybe it's the top limbus rather than the bottom. <laughs> yeah, because you watch for the green. Oh, yeah. Jeff, that's good. <laughs> um, that's excellent. But that's not the reason. He It's his radio. Here's John with his radio. He will wake up in the morning, watch the sun rise. When the sun rises, he turns on his radio. There's a show called Radio West. It's kind of like Uganda NPR. And what time does Radio West play? Well, 7.20 a.m. He says, good morning. This is Radio West in the local language. He says, okay, it's time to take my dose. I'm going to take my dose just as the announcer says, good morning. This is Radio West. And then he goes out, works in the field, comes back, watches the sunset in the evening, turns his radio back on when the sun sets. Guess what time Radio West plays in the evening? <laughs> 7.20 p.m. He takes his dose, turns off the radio to save batteries, goes to sleep, and starts all over again another day. But the story's not over. Here is John's adherence for the first 90 days, and here's his adherence over subsequent 90 days. Still see pretty darn good adherence, but here are these interruptions of several days. And as I tried to argue, this is the recipe for virologic failure. These are about three, four day interruptions, just on the verge of increasing his risk of virologic failure. What's happening to John? What's changed? Batteries, yeah, uh, that, his batteries are working. He saves his battery very judicially. Could be, and it could be the reason, but not in this case. Do something else during the day. Something else that he wants to take his batteries. Could be. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Something happens to John that I believe, fairly confident, has happened to everyone in this room. He falls in love. 
He falls in love with an HIV positive partner who is also on treatment. And she goes to a different clinic. And her clinic runs out of medication. So John is taking his medications out of his pill bottle to give to her, and he's a few days short. The reason I like this story is first, people in the 90s and the early 2000s had really strong views as to how people would or would not adhere to their treatment. Those views were entirely wrong, dataless, fake news. And it wasn't until we started asking questions and said, how does the data, does the data support these views that we're able to turn these views upside down? The other reason I like this story is we as adherence experts were thinking, oh, it's about the missing percent doses taken. We got the measure wrong. It's not percent doses taken, it's patterns. And we also started setting the individual as a unit of analysis. And actually, John's adherence is just fine. What gets John in trouble is not what's happening to him, but what's happening to his partner. And it took us too long to understand that it's relationships and social, social relationships that are driving this behavior combined with economic and structural forces. And that is even John's partner, it's not that she has bad adherence, it's she doesn't have any medications to take. And it's not about individual behavior, it's about drug supply and distribution. So in conclusion, one thing I've learned is humility that we've been wrong much of the time, especially when it comes to predicting behavior of marginalized groups. And that can have a powerful impact and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, can lose the opportunity to benefit from public health. The second is that social context matters. That strength of the social ties, the partner, family, and friends, the impact of HIV on those close social ties, the role of stigma, are the powerful forces that are driving how, who does well, and when people have trouble. And that reliable pre-exposure prophylaxis is impossible by engaging committed, stable partnerships. Very low, very relatively easy population to provide PrEP to. Still questions remain, how do you provide PrEP to partnerships that aren't committed and stable where both partnerships can discuss and support PrEP? And finally, I think one of the things we haven't done well is providing treatment early in the course of disease. Because making sure that everyone's on treatment from the first day of infection is the best thing we can do to render people with fully suppressed virus non-infectious to halt this epidemic. Thank you very much. I would like to um, thank Andrew Moss, my mentor at San Francisco General Hospital, who started me on my research career. I think I shared this story to some of you when I was here another time, that the first paper I ever sent for review, for publication, uh, review and publication, came back. It was a paper before I started working with Andrew. And the reviewer said, important finding, well-designed study, but we recommend the author find an editor whose first language is English. <laughs> English is my first language. <laughs> Andrew taught me how to write. He, see, he looked at the paper, he said, yeah, this, your prose is tortured. Let's start with a sentence and work our way up to a paragraph. <laughs> um, Tom Coates. Um, head of the Center for AIDS Prevention um, in the 90s at UCSF um, was my role model in terms of inclusive leadership.
leadership. Um, Bruce Walker brought me to Harvard. Jessica Haber led all of our uh, electronic adherence work. Peter Hunt and Jeff Martin uh, ran the study from UCSF. Um, most of the ideas are stolen from Steve Deeks at UCSF. And uh, Jared Baton um, led, and Colin Kellum led to prep work. And Norma Ware did all of our qualitative work. Thank you very much. Notice any difference in adherence of gender based, any gender differences in adherence in discordant couples? The, the men do a little bit worse um, when you compare HIV treatment adherence, but in terms of PrEP adherence, we haven't seen much of a difference. Joe? So, thinking about you know, the possibility of scaling up. The whole system. Mm -hmm. uh, are there are there any barriers to it? Like, are there, for instance, are there alternative uses that people could put uh, the device to that would make it saleable? We haven't. We were concerned about loss, breakage, and misappropriation. Um, we've studied probably a couple thousand devices now, and our um, we had some an early early technical glitches that have been largely resolved. Uh, we spent a lot of time improving battery battery life by changing the circuitry, um, making lower power consumption. Very few devices actually broke mechanically, um, and very much fewer were lost or misappropriated, you know, sent to someone else. Um, because the patients, as we found in our qualitative work, really valued this. Valued their there was this was their connection to clinic. Yes. Is there any thought about, particularly in high incidence countries, so I think Uganda mm -hmm. incidence is 7.3, I think, mm -hmm. slightly mm -hmm. climbing. But when you go to South Africa, where you have, or in the southern African yeah. mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. where you have prevalences that are in the 33%, percent mm -hmm. seven percent mm -hmm. about maybe prophylactically inoculating the population with a low dose. Is there any thought that mm -hmm. well, I think the that's, feasibility yeah. of even that approach? Yeah, I, well, I think that's exactly the strategy for pre-exposure prophylaxis, to find in a, in a population where there's 30% prevalence, where HIV incidence in young women of reproductive age can be 3, 4, up to even 5% per year. Percent is Uganda among young girls and young women, mm -hmm. much higher than Western women. And so the challenge is for that population where you're high risk for infection is how do you best deliver pre-exposure prophylaxis for the HIV negative person is taking daily treatment. That's worked well in Uganda with discordant partnerships, able with discordant partnerships. But how we give this to teenage women at risk in Southern Africa hasn't that that problem hasn't been cracked. But if we could, and if they were able to stay on their prep. Then we would have a major, it would have a major impact on preventing HIV transmission. But as a problem of stable partnerships, power imbalance, and we haven't been able to figure that figure that out yet, how to tackle those problems. What yes. are the side effects of the prep treatments? Mm, most people, very few. I mean, some people can have a little bit of nausea, but it's. Um, there are some minor changes in bone density. Um, there can be some small changes in kidney function, um, which was all these were initially really important concerns. But now, with hundreds of thousands of people on prep, um, these have been significant concerns. And side effects is not a major reason that people stop taking their prep. So, you mentioned the, um, the partnership, and then before that, you mentioned how. Uh, the family members, you know, they receive some kind of support economically or whatever, in order to honor their parents or mm -hmm. their uncles or their aunts, they take their medication. I was wondering, um, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there are a lot of children who were born with HIV just mm -hmm. due to their mothers, or, um, and they're orphaned, mm -hmm. how, where do they get their treatment? Do they get yeah. treatment? 
That certainly was the case in the 90s and early 2000s, where many people living with HIV without treatment, especially uh, women with HIV without treatment, would pass the HIV to their child, um, then become ill and die and lead to a positive orphan child. That's so. That's changed. You know, I think the there's still important work to be done in terms of scaling up HIV therapy, but a lot of progress have been, has been made. And most people are on treatment and most people are doing well. And now the women who are living with HIV are fully suppressed on treatment. They don't, the chance of transmitting HIV to the child is almost zero. And the chance that they'll die to the AIDS is very low too. So now we see women with HIV living, having children, and those children are negative and they're able to raise other children. One of the interesting things that one of my former students, Lynn Matthews, has described is, well, having children is as important and even more important than, than preventing HIV. And especially the men, they're kind of clueless being one. And it's hard to engage them into protecting their partner in many circumstances. But men, they want to have children. And so one of the promising strategies in South Africa is a program called Healthy Babies, led by Lynn Matthews, where they advertise to men, say, hey, we have a strategy, you're HIV positive, we have a strategy where you can have a healthy baby. And they don't even talk about HIV at first. Healthy babies, healthy babies. Men want to learn about healthy babies. In order to have a healthy baby, first you get, need to have HIV, get HIV infected. But if you're HIV positive or your partner's positive, there's things we can do. Put you on treatment, put your partner on treatment, put one of you on PrEP. And with the strategies, we can help you have a healthy baby. And we're getting a lot more men into care to get HIV tested, to get their partner tested. Um, and to get the negative on PrEP and the positive on treatment. Maybe have you, your group or others, have mm -hmm. done similar type of research in the U.S. and other Western countries in Europe? And mm -hmm. if so, are the results similar? And as questions mm -hmm. of questions, do you think the same logic models that you used in Africa apply here, or do mm -hmm. you see using different approaches? Well, the, the, I don't know if I... I heard the first, understood the first question. So whether this type of research yeah. mm -hmm. has been done yeah. in the U.S. Yeah. marginalized populations yeah. mm -hmm. in Europe, or mm -hmm. and if the results have been similar, yeah. I think the uh, now the treatment outcomes are largely are largely comparable with HIV treatment. Prep is very different mm -hmm. depending on what setting you're in. Um, yeah. Can you use the same models? Uh, I think the same models apply to with different weights on the predictors. I mean, I think the value of a social relationship I think is important in any setting. And I think as our work through Africa, I really appreciated the value of a social relationship here as well, what, who your treatment supporters are. Um, but clearly the, the economic barriers and structural barriers of treatment are much greater in Africa than they are here. Though there are important structural barriers here into losing your health insurance or being too far away from a clinic that I think are, are very comparable to an African setting depending upon you know, where, where you're living and what your access to health care is and you start to, add, to realizing that care. So yes, there, I think the models, they're the same things but different weights and the different weights really depend on the context and there's probably a lot more heterogeneity in the U.S. than there is in a rural African setting. Okay, yes. Uh, David, you mentioned about the importance of uh, cut tax. And for most of us public health professionals, we know very well Africa is not a country. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, yes. mm -hmm. uh, there's a strong tendency when designing mm -hmm. and implementing health mm -hmm. program in Africa, there's a strong tendency to treat it as though it's a country. Yes. So my question for you is, you, your long-term experience in, mm -hmm. in doing drug adherence in Africa, can you share with us uh, whether uh, what you observe mm -hmm. uh, main difference in terms of adherence mm -hmm. across different African countries? Yes, I think the best difference, the best, most illustrative difference is Uganda 
and countries like Uganda, like Uganda, Kenya, Eastern Africa, uh, are largely subsistence farm, a rural subsistence farming population with an urban population in South, Southern Africa, specifically South Africa. Um, the levels of adherence are different. There are much more, it's much more difficult to, for the levels of adherence are much more variable and lower in South Africa than they are in Uganda. Why that is, I think is very interesting. I think it has to do with the stability of social relationships and support um, in a rural African setting like Uganda and more fractured relationships um, and more uh, more heterogeneity in social class and problems of some of the problems of living in an urban center in South Africa. But yes, South Africa and Uganda, they're very different challenges, very different outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very intrigued by this idea of um, Perhaps adherence is a relatively new field of research, and I'm wondering if has that area interfaced much with um, research on contraceptive continuation? Because I see a mm -hmm. lot of parallels in yes. terms of the importance of partnerships, and also in terms of the kind of historic perspective of well, we'll start this out in stable and married relationships. I don't know if it's going to be appropriate for mm -hmm. women in more casual um, settings. Yes, I mean I think um, yes, I think. A lot of the HIV adherence field draws from the contraceptive literature in terms of how do you maintain adherence over months, not only months, but years, um, to a relatively um, easy to take but daily, daily uh, medication. And the ideas of both execution, how, how you adhere over time, but, not only which, but also persistence, which is how long you use are concepts that are borrowed from the contraceptive literature. I'm not enough of an expert on contraceptive adherence to say, you know, what are, how are the factors different? But I bet there's, I would venture to guess there's a lot of overlap. One last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the viability of PrEP adherence and accessibility to PrEP worldwide, considering mm -hmm. the already existing limitations on appropriate treatment access in countries? I think the, the challenges are the same in terms of the structural, the delivery, um, getting the medications out um, to people, to the ch similar challenges in terms of figuring out who's at risk, and in fact, it's even more complicated because it's more, it's not an H your HIV test, it's the HIV test of your partner help determines your risk, also your geography. So it is more complicated. Um, but in the right context, there's some low-hanging fruit, stable discordant partnerships in Uganda. Um, I think it'll work quite well, or in Kenya. Um, and the time, you don't probably need to take PrEP for a long time if you're in a stable partnership. You do take it while your partner is starting therapy and until they're suppressed, and so you might be able to take PrEP for a short period of time. Um, so, but I think the, the implementation of PrEP, both in a sub-Saharan African setting, but also in the US, there's still a lot more to figure out. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back in today. Oh, can I take a Twitter photo before you go? I want to, yeah, I want to, I want to do a tweet of, the, of the, all of us together. All right. Joe, your eyes are closed. All right, now wave. Wave. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you.